calm, as in remaining calm. It's the 1940s. Our country is embarked on a great world war, World War II. And if you and I were involved in that war, chances are we'd fall in one of three categories. We didn't make it. We barely made it. Probably may have got wounded. Or worse, and if you were a POW, less than 1% would ever escape. The point being would be, if you and I were captured, the first thing we would do before we hit the prisoner war camp is a psychiatrist would interview us to know everything there is to know about you and I. Our likes, our dislikes, are we going to be trouble? How smart is our intellect? How much motor do we have? Can we get things done? They're going to know us inwards and outwards. Then they'll put us in a barracks, and then they'll outside of the prison, there'll be a 15-foot high fence, usually barbed wire. Then they'll go another 15 yards, put up another fence 15 foot high. In between it, dogs, landmines, soldiers. And then the Germans would put a pillbox about 100 yards away, all of them facing inward at the camp. The chances of getting out are slim and none. The British intelligence finds out, look, we got too many guys in prison. We're running short. We need more guys. We need more information. They call the generals together. They get him together, and he says, look, I need information on how to get people out of prison. Every lieutenant, every colonel, every general says the exact same thing. He said, you got to get the guy Clayton. He said, man, we can't hold him in any prison. He said, man, he's just, he's always breaking out. He's got this Houdini complex. He says, what is a Houdini complex? He said, well, ask him yourself. They bring the POW in. This time, well, he's their own prisoner of war, right? As a result of it, he says, look, I, yeah, I have a Houdini complex. He said, what is that? He said, well, General, in my world, Houdini, Harry Houdini came to town one day. He got up on stage. We made the special box for him that there was no way he could get out. Within 30 minutes, he gets out. He said, I lose it in front of everybody. Talk about losing my calm. He said, I turned up and I told Harry Houdini, I bet you $100 that if you let me build the coffin, I'll put it in play, and you ain't getting out. He said, I tell you what, Harry told him, I tell you what, I will do it next Saturday. You make the coffin. $100 up front. Sure enough, he gives him $100. Next thing you know, man, he gets the coffin made. Here comes next Saturday. Houdini's on the stage. Put the coffin there. Within one hour, Harry Houdini is out again. He said, I was so mad and incensed. He said, I remember leaving. Man I, I, man, I was spitting venom, and I told those people that put on the show. I don't see how he got out. I paid that man $100. He said, no, you only paid him 50 He said, no, I paid him 100 He said, no, you paid him 50 because 50 went to the carpenter who made the box for you. Man, brother Christ, he said, general, you got to remain calm in these things. He said, look. We have one of our escapees. You need to talk to him. You need to get our boys out. So he asked him, what, are th what do I need to know about a prisoner of war? He said, three things you need. You got to have money. You got to have a compass and a map. He said, well, man, just we'll put that in the shoe, like in the heel of your shoe. And then when you're running, just stop, look at your thing, look at the compass, pull out the map. It's in your shoe, put it back on. He said, oh, stop, stop. He said, let me tell you, there's one thing you need to know when you escape. Your job is to run. And when you're tired, run faster. And you think you're going to die? Run triple fast. He said, because if they catch you, it's going to be ugly. Then ultimately they'll kill you. But until then, man, that's no answer. Man, he next thing you know, Clayton says, okay. He goes back, he starts playing with it, and then out of nowhere, y'all, it comes to him. He, he gets with the Red Cross, and he says, there's three things we deliver. We deliver supplies, medicine, and board games. So it keeps us entertained. He said, man, there's our answer. He took a board game. He made it about a little bit thicker than normal. And he took a board game, and he took the board game in the middle of the board. It's got like this rich uncle money bag that sits in the very middle. Huge hint. Huge hint. As a result of it, he said, well, where are you going to put the map? He said, I'm going to put that under community chest. He said, well, where are you going to put the money? He said, I guess you're going to put that on free parking. He said, yeah, probably so. And he said, then I'm going to put the compass in just visiting in the jail. Man, you know it is Monopoly. He said, but make no mistake about it, Mr. Clayton. They got to remain calm. 
or they'll lose it. That's the gospel. My brother in Christ, listen to what's happened. The good Lord is carrying the cross 12 foot tall, 8 foot wide. He's carrying it one mile. The good Lord alone received 6,666 wounds, according to the saints. They are on a crucifix. He's having a conversation with two thieves who are also on the cross. They have cursed Christ. They have jeered him. They have spit on him. They have beat him, and they have stripped him. To every one of them up there, man, they are just trying to destroy them mentally and physically. Yet he's having a conversation. While all this is going on, they're about to break his shin to kill him and suffocate him. Did you listen to the conversation? How calm he was. Do you notice he never refers to Christ in a mocking way like they were doing, king of the Jews? He calls him by his first name, Jesus. Just, just remember me. Brother Chris, stop. You and I are first century Jew. Let's go back to what's going on over here. My brother says, Christ, to say you're king and to be crucified doesn't even go hand in hand. That's why everybody is so confused. Why? Because if you're a king, then surely you shouldn't be crucified. I mean, Paul was a citizen. They just cut his head off. This is why Peter decides he wants to be crucified too, albeit upside down, in honor of our Savior, who was the king of the Jews, and they missed it. My brother's Christ, when you heard the word, this, you, I, I want to bring you to my kingdom. Remember when the good Lord uses the word kingdom, He's talking basilios in Greek. He's talking about a basilica. He's talking about a place. He's talking about a boat. He's talking about a realm. He's trying to say there is a place. Now, and look, man, woo, don't forget this part. When he says, this day you'll be with me in paradise, he never said heaven. Go back to the language. Perdissimo. It's a garden. It's an orchard. It's the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Paradise. My brother and sister Christ, this is important to you and I because good Lord doesn't ascend into heaven until 50 days later. Pentecost, 50 days later. The good thief is not waiting for him. This day you're in paradise. The good, Lord, the good thief is not in heaven waiting on him as if, well, he should be here any day now. The gates of heaven aren't open until the good Lord comes. The Jews believed in Abraham's bosom, which is where did Moses... Elijah, St. Joseph, go before the good Lord opened the gates. Garden of Eden, Abraham's bosom. Go back and read the story. It is not parabolic about Lazarus, the poor man, and the rich man who died on the same day. And the rich man is yelling out from hell, Father Abraham, Abraham's bosom. How would he know it's Abraham? He shouldn't. 2,000 years before his time. My brother and sister in Christ, and I need you to remember this too. You need to remember this as Catholics. If you and I are there when we hear the good thief yell out the words, remember me, you and I, our jaw would have dropped. And the reason it would have dropped is because according to St. Augustine and St. Anselm, they actually met 30 years ago. Their paths crossed. Remember when the angel appeared to Peter? Uh, yeah, to Peter. Yeah, I'm sure he did. When he appears to Joseph and says, take Mary and her son, not your wife and the child, Mary and her son, and leave. Herod's coming after him. He has two choices. He can go by water, which is expensive in public, or he can go by land. Here's the problem. You and I know he went by land. The only place to get where they needed to go is through the desert, controlled by the good thief and his father. He made his dad look like a Boy Scout. According to St. Augustine, the good Lord is two years old, and when the good thief sees him, makes the statement, Man, truly, if God could come down, that is how he would come. He said the child was so stunning, he almost, he wanted to look at him, but almost afraid that he couldn't, but he knew he needed to or that he should. He just didn't know if it was appropriate. He even convinced his friend, the good other thief, Dismas, same guys on the crucifix, to let him pass. You know what the other thief said? For 40 pieces of silver, I'll let him go. The good thief had to pay his way, and then what does he tell the good Lord, albeit two, when they walk away? Remember me this day. Did our paths ever cross again? He's saying the exact same words he says at the crucifixion. You know what the good Lord told his mother when he saw him? You'll see them again. One on my right, one on my left. Brother and sister in Christ, is that a foretelling of what is to come? Even worse, 
Imagine you were John at the Last Supper, and you yell out to Christ, Lord, let me be on your right and left with my brother. Man, I can't give you that. You don't want that. Oh, yes, I do. No, they have already been given. Can you imagine John's face when he walks up the crucifixion and seeing the thief on either side, both being crucified? Thank God for unanswered prayers. My brother and sister Christ, it's the ability to remain calm. When everybody else is losing their wits, your ability to stay focused on what's the issue. I don't care if you've forgotten everything I told you. I do, but I'm just being nice. My brother and sister in Christ, there are two things you need to remember. The Garden of Eden and the Garden of Gethsemane. In the Garden of Eden, a man and woman are drawn to a tree. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Christ and ultimately his mother are drawn to a tree, the crucifix. In the Garden of Eden, a man and woman went to the tree to take from it. He went to the tree to give back himself. In the Garden of Eden, a man and a woman raised their hand to take. It was all about them. He raised his hand to be attached to it. It was all about us. When man and woman were in the garden, they went there. They were not clothed and subsequently had to be clothed. He started out being clothed and then was stripped because of our sinfulness. They brought death into the world. He brought life into the world. They closed the garden. Go back and read scripture. There's an angel with a fiery sword that no one else can enter. And now he's reopening it. This day you'll be with me in paradise. All because somebody remained calm. My brothers and sisters in Christ, you and I sit here 2,000 years later. How calm are you during the course of a day? When you get up and you go to work, you know how much love is waiting for you when you get in that door. Emails, text messages, demands, obligations, people yelling, screaming, people want this, they want that. How calm are you? Worse than that, you had to drive to work. People cut you off. People have got their blinker on for the last six miles. Surely they can turn any day now. Mother C, brother, says, Christ, how does it feel when you pass somebody that's been turning for the last six blocks? Do you give them the look? Like, no kidding, really? Maybe they're driving and it's a Sunday, you think it's a Sunday afternoon, but it's a Monday and they're driving half the speed limit. Do you drive along and you kind of look at them like, you know, let's go, hit the, hit the long pedal. Yeah, that'll move her. Brothers in Christ, do you get mad, you go through a parking lot, you can't find a parking spot. And now you got to park 20 spaces out. And then you complain that you hadn't been to the gym in a while as you're walking. My brother and sister Christ, you get upset because somebody cut you off. Somebody's not listening to what you have to say. Brother and sister Christ, when you drive back home and you throw that venom out on everybody at the table, remember, you are culpable for the sin too. So if you cause somebody to sin and then they cause somebody to sin, you and I are buying into that. At the end of the day, our ability to remain logical. You want to win the argument? You want your point to be heard? You want to make sure people understand? You want people closer to Christ? Then you must. You must remain calm so that they can understand where you're going and the logic and the reason that it takes when everybody else has lost their mind. And I'll leave you with this. Never, never argue when you are angry. Never argue when you are angry. It will be the greatest speech that you'll ever live to regret. Stay calm. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.